auroras work like neon signs on an enormous scale. In a neon sign, electricity introduces charged particles into a gas-filled tube. The particles in the gas are excited and start to glow. If the tube has only neon inside, it will glow red. By adding other gases, like argon, a whole range of colors can be produced. The neon sign is driven by the electric field inside the tube, whereas the aurora is actually driven by the magnetic field and energy from the sun. As the energetic particles in a solar storm stream along Earth's magnetic field towards the poles, they excite elements in our atmosphere, causing them to glow. Oxygen molecules emit a green or red color, and nitrogen emits pinks, blues, and violets. While these ghostly lights are usually confined to the poles, extremely strong solar storms can drive them closer to the equator. In 1859, a geomagnetic storm ignited by a huge solar flare created auroras as far south as Rome. The 1859 storm was an unusually powerful event that some have called the perfect solar storm. The 1859 storm taught us a little something about what the sun can do. The storm was so intense and the alignment was so perfect that it simply overwhelmed Earth's natural defenses. A huge solar flare erupts on the surface of the sun. Less than a day later, and 93 million miles away, the wires that carry communications across the Earth begin to spark. Business grinds to a halt worldwide as wildfires are ignited by the smoldering lines. At the same time, colorful auroras light up the skies of cities around the globe. Earth has just been visited by the perfect solar storm. The sun kicked up this just incredible solar flare and a massive amount of energy headed towards Earth. Not only was this storm one of the two most powerful on record, it was also one of the fastest. Ejecting from a sunspot aimed directly at Earth, it raced from the sun to our planet in less than 18 hours. Now it takes a really fast rocket ship years to get to the sun. This storm, this cloud of electrified particles, managed to get here in less than a day. That's incredibly fast. Fortunately, the perfect solar storm took place in 1859, when the only technology vulnerable to the onslaught was the telegraph. Since the era in which we have become dependent on high technology, we've yet to see another perfect solar storm. The question remains, could it happen again? What if we have another one like that? Can we have another perfect storm? Well, I'd say yes, we can. There's no doubt about that. The effects that would be on us today compared to 1859 could be devastating. The effects on Earth and on our communication systems, we don't exactly know. That's the scary part. It's likely that our modern technologies would be battered like beachfront houses during a hurricane. Imagine if we lost all the satellites that relay cell phone calls, television signals, and bank transactions. And what if, at the same time, the failure of power grids cascaded whole regions into darkness for hours or weeks? If these essential services couldn't be restored quickly, chaos wouldn't be far behind. It would definitely be a ripple effect upon society and every man and woman and child that lives on this earth. Solar storms can be as hard to predict as hurricanes. While forecasters lack the technology to foretell the next perfect storm, they do know that one would be more likely to hit at the peak of the sun's 11-year sunspot cycle. What happens is the sun reverses the direction of its magnetic field every 11 years. So in 22 years, it reverses and comes back to where it was. As we near the reversal every 11 years, 
the number of sunspots increases and there's a spike in solar activity. We call that period solar maximum. And those periods are interspersed about five years apart from periods we call solar minimum. So you have this 11 year back and forth between the sun being sometimes very ferocious and it goes crazy and it's like the 4th of July with fireworks all the time. And then it starts to ramp down and for a few years it gets quieter until we get to a low point where there's a firecracker now and then but not a lot going on. Just like hurricane seasons, solar maximums vary in intensity. Some produce many more powerful storms than others. Although we're currently at solar minimum, scientists are watching carefully to see what mayhem the next solar max might unleash. So the last solar maximum was in about 2001, and so the next one ought to be about 2012. But there are different predictions. The whole field of solar physicists is basically waiting with bated breath to see what actually happens. There are some wildly divergent opinions on what's going to happen. One group is suggesting that this next solar cycle could be the strongest in, in modern times. If those predictions are correct, Earth could be in for a wild ride. We might have to worry about a repeat of the 1859 event. If that were to happen today, it would wreak untold damage. We're going to learn a whole lot about what can happen to modern technology when the sun blows its top. Much of the violence in the sun erupts here, in the hellish outer atmosphere known as the corona. This region has long held one of the great solar mysteries, because even though it's half a million miles from the heat-generating core, it burns at millions of degrees. This seems to violate the very laws of physics. That's very strange. I have a thermometer here. If I hold the thermometer close to the fire, it reads a very high reading. Where the probe is right now, it's over 200 degrees. Now, if I pull the probe out a little farther from the fire, okay, it drops down to about 90 degrees. Now, the farther I get from the center, the cooler it gets. In the atmosphere, the corona of the sun, the temperature soars as hot as the core. That's as if I were to say, well, way off behind me there, the heat from the fire is as hot as the fire itself, even though it's very far from the fire. <laughs> 